There you go. Now, in Ireland, there are around 300 people more than a century old, which makes them older than the state we live in. A new documentary, which is already creating a huge buzz, uh, talks to some of those people. And you heard a clip of it there. It's called Older Than Ireland. We're joined by the director, Alex Fagan. Alex, good afternoon to you. How are you, Sean? Uh, now, you'd think... Um, You'd think if you, if you said, right, I'm going to make a film, I'm going to interview people uh, who are centenarians or older, uh, that the difficulty may be finding ones that are hale and hearty and, and that kind of thing. But you didn't. it sounds like it seems like you didn't have much difficulty. No, no, uh, you'd be really surprised. And uh, what we found was is just how amazingly engaging they were and how good they were at telling their story. And uh, so we went around the country and we we, uh, we started off with one and then they would recommend another centenarian up the road <laughs> and then when we interviewed that person, they'd recommend another. We sort of meandered our way around the country doing it that way because it's hard to kind of, there's no, there's no sort of uh, uh, society for centenarians. Yes. Perhaps there should be now. <laughs> yeah, but, they, but it, yeah, it was odd that they seemed to know each other. Yeah, yeah. Or so at least know of each other. They knew of each other or a, fa or a family member would know. Well, you know what? I read something in a local newspaper about, uh, you know, Kitty Fingleton up the mm -hmm. Road and she's a hundred she's a hundred so we'd go up and interview kitty and and that's how it kind of happened and uh, it was such an honor it was one of those sort of documentaries that you get once in a lifetime opportunity and uh, was it was it difficult to get people if you like from uh, different sorts of background working class middle class rural city that all that kind of stuff well it was really just a case of whoever whoever was over a hundred and who wanted to talk to us we we interviewed so and then out of that came uh, the all the varieties of society you we had working class Dubs, we had uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, landlords, we had uh, every form of uh, society that you could possibly imagine. Mm. So I suppose if you could use like political parlance, it was a good 30 people, it was a good poll of what the general centenarian thinks. Yeah. Uh, so by watching the film, you do, you do get a good sense of what that generation thinks about Ireland, what they think about how far we, uh, how we've come and, uh, and wh whether it's good or bad. Yeah, no, that's, uh, and that's a very interesting point because, you you know, I suppose that the stereotypical narrative is that uh, older people go, ah, it's all crap, and it was it was much better in my day. But no, that wasn't uh, the case at all. No, no, um, all the centenarians were agreed to say that society was much better today than what it was back when they were young. I mean, a lot of them had a lot of poverty; they mm -hmm. had no electricity. Uh, I mean, they remembered when the orange first came in. One lady thought it was a football. Uh, so, <laughs> so you can imagine. I suppose if there was one thing, like the, I suppose you know, one of the uh, you, expectations in a film like this, you might have, oh, back in my day, it was like this, and back. It's not like that at all. Like they're they're telling they're telling their stories, uh, uh, f you know, uh, in a way that that just comes across as if it was yesterday for them. Mm. And and I suppose if there if if, any, if anything, if there was one thing that they think about society today versus society back then that that has disapproved. It's just that people don't talk to each other as much as what they used to. Neighbours kind of cocoon mm. themselves inside their houses and I think that's a bad thing. Yeah, and, and did they have any, I mean, obviously uh, economically and, and the circumstances of our life, uh, things are better off. What, you know, what do they think about things like Ireland was a far more Catholic country when they were growing up and, and the way things have become secular and perhaps more permissive. Yeah, I suppose that's, it was really interesting because I, I had a preconception that they w people of that generation would be very conservative. Mm. And it wasn't at all. I mean, we interviewed one lady and she said, do you know about re about religion? She goes, I just, you know, can any one of us prove it? You know, and I wasn't <laughs> expecting her to come out with that. And uh, another man, he he, uh, he lost his sister through a, a, a very painful death and he just said he kind of lost faith after that. You know, obviously, in general, people, uh, you know, they all had a very strong faith, mm. uh, which was to be expected. And, and you know, one lady from Dublin, Bessie Nolan, she said, you know, she felt that uh, she, while she had a faith, she didn't, re you know, she wasn't so much interested in the Catholic Church. Mm. So, the, you know, I think whatever you imagine of our own generation, you could almost supplant that into that generation. And, and you know, it, it, it's they're not that much different. Yeah, in the, and especially, I suppose, in, in, in the variety of the ways uh, they'd look at. Were most of them living in homes? Were they with living with family members? What kind of circumstances did you find these people? Uh, in uh, all different types of circumstances, we had we interviewed uh, you know people who were living by themselves for years uh, in homes as well. Uh, you know they look after themselves. One man in Tipperary, he picks up his home help in the car. He drives her, picks her up in the car, drives her home in the car and, <laughs> <laughs> and he's 101 and uh, he was telling us about uh, how nervous he was to do his driving test again and he was saying you know if if, uh, if you crash into me 
and it's your fault, it's my fault because you're going to say that we're well, rattled bastards or something. Like that. Pardon, pardon my French, but uh, <laughs> you know, he had a great sense of humor about it. That's extra. And if when you're 101, how often do you have to retake a driving test? Oh God, I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah. I think he said say every six months. <laughs> well, I suppose it. Yeah. Well, I and he passed it, it by the way. He actually that's passed it. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. That's absolutely uh, uh, extraordinary. Now, in terms of then how far back they can remember, um, they would be older than than the state itself. But could they could they actually have any memories of historical events that we learned about in school? Absolutely. I mean, uh, like I suppose the, the film takes two sort of uh, it takes two journeys. One is the historical, and the other one is the personal. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of the historical, uh, I mean, we, we interviewed a man who was in Crow Park in 1920 when the Black and Tans in Bloody in Bloody Sunday, uh, who's 103, Jimmy Barry from Waterford. Mm-hmm. We interviewed a lady whose father took the surrender in 1916, and she remembered wa- uh, climbing up a water tower in the Curra where she lived and she was able to see the flames rising above Dublin. We interviewed another lady who sat on a wall and watched the custom house ablaze and she was waving a French flag that her neighbour gave her <laughs> and, she, and, and her mother went crazy because they, those were the British colours. Uh, every single centenarian we interviewed had a story about the black and tans and they all had a story about the Civil War and what was interesting was they don't hold any bitterness towards the British. They don't, uh, they, they were as they were as, uh, I suppose, disappointed during this, as uh, of the of the Irish during the Civil War as they were by the whole black and tans thing. Uh. They they all sp- speak of the horrors during that time, but ultimately they all they all come out of it thinking that Ireland's a better country for it. Uh, although one man did say that he says we're still paying the price for that bloody Civil War. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> well, what did he mean by that? Yeah. I, I, I I think I think economically. Yeah. But he but but as well as that, uh, you know, we had all different sides of that of that. Uh, you know, we, we as I said, we interviewed. Uh, Church of Ireland people we interviewed a man who was in the IRA he was uh, from Killarney mm-hmm. he got a, a coin from Michael Collins and he also uh, brought Eamon de Valera around Killarney so we, we were talking to these guys and then randomly they would come out of it with this stuff uh, which was which was just remarkable because you're, it's like you're really you're really connecting yourself to history mm-hmm. um, but as I said then there's this other side which is this personal journey which is as you, as you heard you know the first kiss mm-hmm. the first pair of shoes the the uh, uh, the wedding day, how how uh, this man explains how he proposed to his wife. He says he didn't drink that day. He was walking home from the dance and he says, I didn't drink. <laughs> I wanted to be of sound mind. Because we, do, I suppose that we do have a view as well that we, you know, people would go to dances on bicycles and stuff and, 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 and you know, there'd be a parish priest outside with the blackthorn stick to make sure no couples were courting and all that well, kind of stuff. That from, all sounds more innocent. Yeah, one man from Russ Coleman said there were no dance halls in our parish. He called them the dens of inequity. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's right. The bicycle was a big deal because that was when you could actually go to the next parish to meet a girl, which was a bit, you know, that oh, was... Uh, a bit racy. Yeah. <laughs> well, how, did, how did couples get together then if they couldn't go to a dance? Well, in the case of that man, he never married. He said, you know, and he came from a very poor, like, you know, he's part of us common. And he said, you know, I, I, could, I didn't marry because I had no money. There were no houses. And and that's what he, and that's what he that's what he told us and uh, a, a, an absolutely lovely gentleman uh, when I was when we were in filming he gave me a pint of Guinness. <laughs> for a juice up, for a, I think we do we do, do have another little clip to play for you. So have a listen to this. I suppose our lives today are being run by computers. I don't I don't have any Google or Twitter or t- I have no mobile phone by the way. But I'm bloody glad to be mobile myself. There you go. Uh, I don't think that's uh, that's unique to older people uh, not having any Google or Twitter and not particularly uh, <laughs> missing it. Um, given that they all lived uh, t- to such a good age, uh, were they all non-drinking, non-smoking vegans? Not at all, not at all. I mean, we interviewed smokers, we interviewed drinkers, we interviewed gamblers. Uh, like, I, I'm not a doctor, and I, I, I like to qualify qualify that by saying that. But I'm sure if you, you know, one lady, by the way, she said she she never ate a vegetable in her life, and she put, she uh, she claimed that her longevity was put down to that. Uh, so <laughs> there's a, there, there, I mean, like I suppose when we set out with this film, I had this sort of idea that I discover the secret to longevity, mm-hmm. and initially I thought it was, uh, you know, to do. With dieting and all that and then very quickly I realised that had nothing to do with it and then I thought it was to do maybe they all had this really positive attitude in life mm. but then I met people who really didn't and they kind of had enough and they kind of said you know what I'm happy to go now uh, uh-huh. and then, and then yeah. I kind of thought uh, you know maybe it's you know maybe it's everyone's thin but then I met loads 
people who were overweight and, and who had who were confined, you know, hadn't moved. And we kind of came to the conclusion, I really, I suppose what they all had in common was they all just loved to talk and they all loved to tell mm-hmm. their story. And so they all had that sense of engagement with society, which I think was, uh, which was sort of interesting, you know. So uh, what came out then, like when we arrived into these houses, we thought we better, you know, we won't be long. Don't worry, we won't be mm-hmm. long. And they were like, no, stay, sure, what else are we doing? You know, keep chatting. <laughs> <laughs> Tea was coming out. And, uh, but what we found was is that these people have no pretense whatsoever. They're the most genuine people you'll ever meet. Mm. And what the, and the reason for that is they're a hundred. They just don't mind. They don't care. They don't care what I think and they don't care mm. what anyone else thinks. They just, they're just so honest. And, and, and so there's a, a real sort of spirituality to that. Uh, I suppose it, which, which, which can be garnered after, after interviewing 30, you kind of get this sense of, God, these people are really, they really have something. Yeah. Cause I suppose you know? it's liberating. When, so, because, yeah. for, because few of us can actually say we don't care what anybody thinks. But no. when you get to 103, Feck. <laughs> yeah. Like I interviewed one lady, she's the oldest Irish lady in, on record, uh, uh, Kathleen Snavely, who's 113. And uh, she's. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I asked her, you know, what's the secret to reaching 113? And she said, uh, as quick as a flash, you know, uh, the other day I was getting my gallbladder uh, surgery done, and this lady saw, saw my age, and she goes, how, what, how the hell did you reach 113? She says, well, I worked hard all my life, and then I turned prostitute. She goes, I'm so sick of people <laughs> asking me that question. I that's what I tell them. <laughs> That's uh, in the film. How's the uh, how's the uh, how's the film career going? Because you made the uh, people I know you made the documentary about the Irish pub, and now this one, and this one looks at to be a huge hit. What, what's next for you? It's going quite well, Alex. I must say. Oh, thank you, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> so we have, we're we have, we're plan, planning another documentary and a drama, and so uh, we'll work on those next, and uh, hopefully people react to them in a positive way. Right. Okay. <laughs> now uh, the film. What kind of distribution have you got around Ireland? So it's playing in cinemas. Uh, it's on general release in selected cinemas and you can find those cinemas on olderthanireland.ie or on our Facebook page which is forward slash older than Ireland there's lots of clips from the mm-hmm. film on that as well and it's playing in uh, in, in the Lighthouse in Dublin and uh, the IFI movies at Dundrum Swords the Gate in Cork the Eye in Galway and uh, cinemas all over the country alright so. fantastic stuff <laughs> Alex thanks a minute for coming into us Alex Fagan there the film is called Older Than Ireland we'll take a break after that Miss Nigeria Ireland <laughs>